Hi, my name's Ronnie. I wrote this story. It's set in Greece on the island of Gavdos. It's called The Bookmark. Slim and soft with a light leathery texture. The bookmark slid discreetly between the pages of whatever I was reading at the time to mark my place. After a while, a small hole was gently punched into one end and a red silk tassel was added. This is a lovely bookmark, people often commented, running their fingertips over the smooth surface of my rare treasure. Where did you get it? They would ask, wondering if there was some way to acquire one of their own. Unfortunately for them, my bookmark was one of a kind. It was priceless and irreplaceable. Greece, I would reply with a smile, on Gavdos. Most people have no idea where that Greek island might be located, and I was never particularly interested in enlightening them. Reluctant to impart any further information about the original origin of my special bookmark, I would carefully change the subject, veering the conversation towards upcoming events, my latest delicious find at the French market, or the colour of someone's recently pedicured toenails. It's impossible to count the number of fingertips that caress the little beige strip nestled between the pages of my current book. Visitors sometimes confess that they came especially to see it, an item of much curiosity. It was frequently sniffed and touched, closely inspected and commented upon. One man, a close friend of mine, rubbed it against his cheek and marvelled at its unusual softness to my perverse amusement. Curious people guessed what it was made from. Duck leather, fish skin, kangaroo belly, no, they weren't even close. Somehow, my bookmark had become an enigmatic symbol that represented a secret part of myself. Despite being questioned endlessly by some of my friends and colleagues, I refused to share the true mystery of the bookmark. After such visits, I often took a break from work and sought out a hammock for a siesta, allowing myself to reminisce letting each comment, each caress, each question transport my mind back to a blissful and carefree summer when I island hopped around Greece, jumping on and off boats to take in the sun, sea, history and the brilliant white architecture of the Aegean archipelago. Then I was in my late twenties, an adventuress with an insatiable curiosity and energy to match. I had heard about Gavdos from other travellers. The ferry from Crete stopped there once a week. I was determined to be on that boat. Barely able to decipher the Greek letters on the old schedule posted on the wall at the dock on Samos, I more or less guessed what time the ship would set sail. I noted the route and departure times, hoping I got it right. At the ticket booth, I paid my fare and boarded a large rusting bucket so old it could have, could have been built by Archimedes. The boat didn't look like it would float if the engine room was filled with helium. An hour later, the horn blasted and the ancient ferry chugged to life, creaking and groaning as the azure water churned under its bow. I leaned against the rail, watching the sun shimmer on the surface as we rumbled away from the port, and thus my adventure began. After a long lazy afternoon of alternately reading Colleen McCulloch's The Ladies of Missalonghi and gazing dreamingly out to sea, I settled down for the evening among several hundred other passengers. Darkness enveloped the boat. The lights were dim and many didn't work. Preparing for a 30 plus hour journey across the water, I rolled out my sleeping bag and slithered inside, snuggling against myself for warmth as we crossed the Aegean Sea, 
sailing from one iridescent Greek island to another. Some pas passengers snored in their seats. Others draped hoods over their heads and leaned against the railings, and many, like me, had brought sleeping bags in which to spend the night. The boat shuddered and rolled. The diesel engine coughed and spewed black smoke behind us as we inched forward, crawling through the dark sea towards the next coastline. Patmos was the first stop. The boat emptied at once, backpackers and tourists pouring onto the dock to explore the island's historic centre, Chora, the Monastery of St. John, the Theologion, and the Cave of the Apocalypse. Within minutes, a few passengers boarded and the boat chugged away from the small port. At Amorgos, the easternmost island of the Greek Cyclades, <clears throat> I barely stirred in my sleeping bag, vaguely aware of docking, the rustle of a couple of people disembarking, and the lumbering ferry continuing on her journey, lulling her snoozing cargo into deeper sleep with the rhythmic drumming of her engines. In the morning, I felt like I had dreamed the second stop. At dawn, a shrieking whistle roused still drowsy travellers, alerting everyone half an hour in advance that the dock at Thera was in sight. If I squinted, I could make out the hazy shadow of an island just on the horizon. All around me bubbled the chaos with passengers arranging their belongings, ready to disembark. Mumbled words tumbled incoherently from a loudspeaker above our heads. It was all Greek to me. Leaning against a cold metal wall, I watched the action with interest. On Santorini, the sun rose over the jagged peaks of the volcanic caldera, reflecting sharply off alabaster roofs that cascade dramatically down the rocky cliffs. A bell rang in the distance. Two men shouted at each other, their gestures violent as they negotiated a suitable price for fresh fish. The dock was a hive of activity. Mustachioed men ran around yelling orders. Teenagers in cloth caps carried boxes and passages, packages. A stout woman in black waddled up the ramp with a covered hamper in the crook of her elbow. Vendors carrying wicker baskets laden with breads and pastries hurriedly came aboard. Tiny tubs of creamy yogurt, slices of salty feta cheese and fat black olives suddenly became unexpected choices for breakfast. In sharp contrast to the soggy sandwich offerings from the ferry's cafeteria. One lady sold polished red apples. Passengers clamoured to buy what they could. In, sh in a short time, a bell rang, and the vendors vanished from the decks within seconds, as if magically dragged back to shore with a powerful magnet. A few minutes later, the horn blasted, and the ferry pulled away from the dock. The craggy island began to fade into the distance. Soon, nothing more than a fuzzy haze across the water. That day was hot, without a single cloud. Heat reflected off the heavy steel bulkheads and seeped into our skin. Clear turquoise water glittered all around the ferry. Apart from one tiny island in the distance earlier in the morning, there was no land in sight. We were adrift in the middle of nowhere. The engines chugged relentlessly while sweaty passengers chattered. Seagulls visited periodically. After a pigeon bath in a tired bathroom sink, I changed into shorts and a tank top and found a shady spot with a breeze to lie down and read. It wasn't long before I was dozing again. In limbo between here and there, I drifted in and out of sleep sometimes awake enough to eat what was left of my travel rations, sometimes sleepy enough to continue my dream. Mid-afternoon, the horn blared again. My mind still blurry from too much slumber, 
I didn't register until we were approaching the dock. Reef no? I asked someone nearby. He shrugged and turned his back. I asked a dozen people. Reef no? Finally, someone confirmed the destination. We were indeed arriving at Reithmo on the island of Crete. Just then, nature didn't just call, it screamed blue murder. Aware of the urgency, I hauled my possessions into the bathroom, struggling to get my backpack inside the minuscule cubicle and tended to my explosive needs. The boatswain's whistle pierced the air. In trying to hurry, each second felt like an hour. The whistle shrieked once more. Finally done, I raced towards the exit ramp. As I ran, I saw the lumbering steel ramp coming up again, ascending towards the boat. I ran harder. A crew member ran towards me. I could see he was going to stop me from running off the boat. Time stood still for a moment as I measured the distance between me and the beach and the distance to the man running towards me. I have to get off, I yelled and ran full throttle along the ramp. It was two metres off the ground when I leaped into the air and landed on the beach. I lost balance and dropped onto one side, lying on my back like a stranded turtle. The man on the boat cursed in Greek for a full minute, then disappeared behind the rising ramp. Water churned and bubbled as the boat's engine revved and it turned towards the sea. Rolling onto my knees, I smiled and waved back at the irate crew member, giving him a thumbs up. His dark scowl did nothing to enhance his misshapen features. He waved a fist and cursed some more. The two men beside him laughed as the ferry pulled away from the ramshackle dock. At the bus station, a man in a white cap offered to take me and three others to Chura Shafkon in his rusty old jalopy. The bus trip was four and a half hours. He promised he could get us there in an hour and a half for the same price. A couple from Spain and a man from Germany squeezed into the back seat while I took the front passenger seat. Our backpacks were stuffed into the trunk, which was tied with a bungee cord because it wouldn't close. Dimitris took off like a racing car driver, screeching around corners and flying down the road, leaving bits of the chassis in his wake. It took the Spanish woman 10 minutes of screaming to convince our enthusiastic chauffeur that brake net speeds were not appropriate. We were happy to take longer to get there. As long as we arrived alive, we explained. Our hearts descended from our mouths as he grudgingly agreed to proceed at a slower pace along the roughly paved road. By the time we reached the turn off to the mountain at recess, peace was restored within the vehicle. It, had, it has never ceased to amaze me the way travellers constantly place their lives into the hands of total strangers, blindly trusting that person to bring them safely to their destination. Demetrius navigated corners and curves, his car creaking as it strained to make the turns, driving slowly up to the village of Kares until the plateau of Askifu spread out before us, surrounded by the peaks of the White Mountains. Tiny picturesque, picturesque villages dotted the roadside. Amud Hari and Petrus brushed gently past our windows, then, leaving us gasping and awestruck, we drove alongside the deep Imbros Gorge. Intermittently, the sense of pine and thyme reached in and tickled our nostrils. The Libyan sea stretched out in front of us as far as the eye could see, and I got my first glimpse of Gavdos shimmering in the distance. Finally, we braved the 12 kilometer descent through a series of hair-raising hairpin bends, the road doubling back on itself and twisting like a snake all the way down to the coast until we finally reached Chorus Safkion, 
where the vibrating vehicle came to a shuddering halt. The Spanish couple kissed the earth and vanished post haste. The German clicked and clucked, grabbed his rucksack and marched stiffly away. Thank you, Demetrius, I said with a smile as he handed my, me my small day pack. Welcome, he replied with a big cheesy grin, shaking my hand. I see you when you come back. I take you where you want to. Let's see what happens, I counted, not willing to make promises or take any more chances on my life. Shouldering my bag, I went to find the ticket office for the Gavdos ferry. It was closed until the morning, but a timetable assured me there was a ferry scheduled for the following day. I checked into a nearby hotel, the name of which escapes me, and spent half the night itching and twitching. Even the bed bugs were flea bitten. Disgusted, I scrubbed myself, top to toes, under the whining shower head, and, despite the warmth of the night, crawled into my sleeping bag, preferring to sleep on the floor as far from the infested bed as possible. The moment dawn broke, I was out of there. Around the corner was an open cafe, offering thick homemade yogurt and fresh fruit for breakfast served by a cheerful rotund woman with pink cheeks and a brilliant smile. As the vill village gradually woke, shutters opened and faces appeared in the windows. Goat bells rang, dogs barked, ducks clucked, and a motorbike roared to life. I sat for hours, leisurely observing as locals came and went about their daily business. Just before the appointed time, I headed back over to the ferry ticket office where a pleasant lady stamped my ticket and said I could wait inside if I liked. The ferry to Gavdos was leaving in four hours. Content to wander around and explore the village, I left my bag at the ticket office. I walked along the main street, past the tavernas and mini markets, the butcher and the bakery, towards a quiet beach just west of the village where I stretched out in the shade and caught up on a couple of hours sleep missed the night before. I made a mishmash lunch of bits and pieces I bought en route back to the dock. Then I collected my backpack from the smiling lady and sat down to wait for the departing ferry. Had I known what I was in for, I'd have bought earplugs to shut out the sound of the roaring motor that shattered the crystal air of paradise into a million shards. When we finally arrived, the silence following the departure of that ferry was one of the most blissful experiences I've ever had in all my world travels. After the kerfuffle of embarking passengers and unloading precious cargo for the villagers, only two other people stood on the white sand beach, a couple on their honeymoon, Apart from the dock, this little trip of, strip of sand was deserted. The couple nodded in greeting and heaved their rucksacks onto their backs before wandering towards the end of the short beach and disappearing around the point. I dusted the sand out of my eyes and followed, pretty sure it was the next beach along we had come to experience. As I rounded the corner, an abundance of bare flesh bounced on brilliant white sand. There was a volleyball go game going on. Nude volleyball. This tiny beach in Gavdos was famous for its nudist beach, easy to access, but only for people willing to shed their clothes. Wasting no time, I dumped my backpack at a vacant tent site and stripped. Apart from volleyball, the most strenuous activity on the beach was waking up each morning to a spectacular azure sea glistening in front of the tent. It was bliss. As the long days passed, we got to know each other. Bill and Celeste were from Canada. Joe was Scottish. Melissa was French. It was the United Nations of nudists. We played cards under the pine, under the shade of pine trees. Monopoly and Scrabble boards rested on folded towels. 
Jenga blocks toppled from a tree stump table and colourful sarongs protected sunbathing bottoms from fine white sand. Please dress for dinner, stated a sign on the restaurant wall. It was acceptable to run around in your birthday suit all day and all night if you liked, but guests were requested to wear something for dinner because, you know, we're all eating. There was only one restaurant. Gavdos was mostly a deserted island. Its village had become a ghost town. It was here that everyone made formal introductions. Oh, it's you, they squealed delightedly. I didn't recognize you with your clothes on. Friends were made quickly and within hours, I found myself surrounded by artisans, lawyers, architects, and a civil engineer who were all making the most of their summer vacations. For them, it was all about the tan. Each day we spent hours sunning our naked bodies and comparing the browns of our legs and arms at the dinner table. All over tanning was the newest competitive sport. One morning, after a particularly interesting night involving a deck of cards, a pile of pink shells used as bedding ship chips, and a large bottle of ouzo, I could barely crawl out of my tent. The blistering sun burned into my eyes as I emerged, parched and nauseous. It was too hot to stay inside the tent, and I was not up for an early volleyball game. Content to sip water and lie in the sun, I soon fell asleep. It was hours later when I woke, feeling as if my body had been scorched with a cooking torch. Every part of my back, from my heels to the scruff of my neck, had sizzled to a deep red hue. I could barely move. The next week passed in a blur of searing pain and a variety of international burn creams. Lying in the protective shade of cedar trees and dipping my blistered hide in cool water at dawn and dusk to soothe my self-inflicted injuries. Finally, the worst of it passed and I began to feel human again. It wasn't long before my skin began to peel. Each day, strips of my usually thick pelt fell into my fingers as they sought yet another itch. To avoid scratching, I spent more time in the crystal Mediterranean water. My body flayed and raw, rejoiced in the relief of the cool sea, but still shied from the sun. Creams and oils failed to prevent peeling and soon I remembered, resembled a speckled fish monster. One evening, as I was dressing for dinner, I noticed a small section of a blister on me, my behind that had become loose. It wasn't as itchy as usual, and it felt slightly thicker than the earlier peelings. Carefully, I started peeling it back. It got bigger in my fingers as I gently loosened the dead skin from my flesh. It took ages for the section to come away cleanly. The piece of skin was as large as a book. I laid it on my diary to measure the size. It was astounding. It had started on my hip and peeled all the way across my right butt cheek. Realising the value of this unique souvenir from Greece, I carefully folded it over and over, gently pressing the skin into itself until it was slim and soft with a slight leathery texture. For many years, it marked the pages of my books.